God. All right, let's go to the Word. Today we're kicking off a three-week series called Joy to the World. Because how many even know this world needs a ton, ton of joy? I mean, it does. You know, with our current situation in the world today, the tension in the world, the turmoil, the political unrest and, and disease, everything, the uncertainty. But here's what I love, that in the middle of all of that, God wants to inject his joy. God wants to inject his life-transforming, overcoming, victorious joy into our lives. That's what he wants to do because we all need joy. I need joy. Every single day, I need the joy of the Lord because there are times, right, that we get into a funk. There are times we get into funk. Usually what happens, that funk comes because we start to put our trust in our own understanding. We start to lean on ourselves. We start to, and what happens is when we lean on ourselves, we start getting frustrated and upset and angry and bitter. And other times we feel overwhelmed with the pressure of work and home and school and bills and family issues and your teenagers acting up and all the, you know, all these different things. And, but we all need joy. And the good news about this joy is that no matter where you are on the journey with God, whether you're just beginning or you've been there a long time, listen, God loves you so much that he wants to overwhelm you with his joy. God wants to make a tangible, listen, tangible difference in your everyday life. A tangible difference means you can tell the difference. Other people can tell the difference. That's what God wants to do. And one of the ways he does is with real joy. You know, like I just said, growing up in church, we used to have all these sayings, these isms. The world didn't give it to me, and the world can't take it away, right? We used to sing that song. But here's the truth, and this is, this is very true. Joy sometimes leaks. It leaks. You see, uh, my kids, they have a basketball court at home, you know, the kind that you fill the base with water, and it stays there, and you play basketball for a while. Because after a season, and I've, I notice this with my neighbors, is these things begin to leak. Slowly but surely, you don't always tell right away, but they start to leak. Leak to the point where eventually, how many of you know we had these strong winds this week? Well, mine had leaked so much that I woke up to my neighbor calling me and said, you better come outside. And I go outside and it had leaked and my basketball court had crashed through my truck window because the wind took it because why it leaked. And here's this, <laughs> my joy was momentarily taken. But here's what happens is if we're not on a daily basis, if we're not careful on how we respond to everything that goes on in our life, it has a way of chipping away at our joy and it eventually leaks out to the point where our lives come crashing down. It just leaks out. And so we're, we're, what I want to do for the next few weeks is we're going to rediscover because sometimes we have to just remind ourselves. We're just going to rediscover how God actually can bring overwhelming, victorious joy into your life even in the midst of hard times. Amen. So let me pray. Heavenly Father, I pray in Jesus' name. Today, Father God, if we don't get anything else, Lord, I pray let us get the joy of the Lord. I pray let us, Father God, get us get that, that skip back in our step again, Father God. Lord, I pray, Lord, that once again you'll change our perspective and help us, Lord, understand, Father God, that all things work together for the good. Father God, we ask for your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. How many of you like feeling happy? I like feeling happy, right? I enjoy feeling happy. Who doesn't like being happy? But the truth is what we really need is joy. Joy. See, our soul needs joy because our soul, it, it is designed to operate to its optimum potential off of joy. Off of joy. I want you to understand this. Bible says this. We know this scripture by heart, Nehemiah 8.10. For the joy of the Lord is my... So what do you need it when you're weak, Right? It says it's your strength. It's your strength. And real tangible joy doesn't come from anything else except from God. Nothing on this planet can produce the joy in your life that God can. And what happens is the joy, that joy, it fills your soul. It gives you fuel. I want you to consider, think of it as fuel. It gives you fuel to keep on moving forward. Pastor Mary, who was uh, our, one of our first pastor. Uh, growing up, I mean, not growing up, but in our church where we serve, she's gone on to be with Jesus. Every time you'd see her and tell her something, like she would ask you what's going on in your life. And if you complained to her, she would always say this. Say, she had this ism and she would say, you just got to keep on keeping on. And basically what she is saying is like, you just keep moving forward. But how many of you know that when you're dealing with very difficult situations, the only way you can keep moving forward is when you've got the joy of the Lord. That's how you keep moving forward. 
Listen, I, I, it's funny because I, I'm saying it, I, I use it as fuel, but when we first moved to Orlando, and it was hot, by the way, when we first moved, when we first moved to Orlando, my neighbor sold me a, a lawnmower, a ride-on lawnmower, and I thought it was a great deal because how many of you know that riding on a lawnmower in Orlando was better than walking behind one because it's hot, right? So I'm in this lawnmower, and one of the things that was a special ride on lawnmower, that's why he sold it to me, he forgot to tell me that this specific lawnmower, you had to put an additive in the fuel to get it going, right? So I had this old gas tank of gas that I had, so I just pumped it in there, and it turned on, and it sputtered, and probably ran for a good five, ten minutes, and then it sputtered out and stopped, stopped working. And I would try again and try again, and smoke is coming out, and figure out what's going on, and then I went and got my neighbor. He's like, what kind of gas did you put in it? And what I told him was like, you don't, you don't put that kind of gas in it. You got to put this in it. And so we ended up having to take the carburetor out and cleaning it up. It was, a, it was a mess, but we got it working eventually because I put the right stuff in it. And here's what I'm trying to tell you is that your life can run unhappy, but eventually it will run out. It needs joy. To, it's the fuel that keeps you going. It, happy will only, only get you this far. You need joy sustains you. Joy keeps you going, okay? And in case you didn't know, there's a difference between joy and happiness. Simply put, listen, happiness is a feeling that you get that's controlled by your happenings. Okay, so happiness is controlled by what is happening in your life. Okay, it's a feeling you get that is controlled by your emotions. When That's what happens. It's, it's, it's by what's happening all around you, right? But. If things, so if things are going your way, right, maybe things are going well at work and you've been working, now your, your boss says, listen, you're doing such a great job. You want people to, you, you, feel, you feel like they're recognized. You guess what? You're happy. You're happy. I'm getting recognized at work. But if you're feeling overwhelmed and everyone's ignoring your hard work, guess what? You're not happy because it's according to your happenings. Your happiness might be connected to a relationship. And we all know this because those of you that are in relationship, you know, whether you're married or you're single, that when you're doing well in relationship and there's a sense of connectivity and intimacy, well, guess what? You're happy. You feel happy. But when things are rough and rocky, you're not so happy. You're not so happy. If you're having a good hair day, then you're happy. If you're having a bad hair day, don't talk to me. You know what I'm saying? It's a feeling you have that's controlled by what's going on around you. So I like saying it this way. Happiness is, is outside in. It's things that we do on the outside that determine how I'm going to feel on the inside, which is very different than joy. Joy is inside out. It's the state of, what I, of how I'm feeling currently, not even feeling. I'm going to share with you in a minute. But it's a delighting. It's a gladness. It's a confidence that is not connected to your happenings, but it's given to us as a, fr- as a free gift by Jesus Christ. Joy is a gift. It's a gift. If you can get any gift this holiday season, we want you to have the gift of joy. Yes. It's a gift. And every gift given by God serves a purpose in maturing and strengthening us, right? How many, one of the craziest things that parents say, we do this all the time, when our kids drive us crazy, right? And we, we're like, Lord, oh, just give me patience to deal with this. And you know what the Lord is saying? I did. It's called three little kids. I'm teaching you patience. And you ask yourself, well, Lord, why do I need joy? Think about it. When you're in your moment of weakness, because the joy of the Lord is mine. We think it's laughter. It's wrong. It produces laughter in us. And it produces a good sense. But it's something else. It produces strength in us. It's the fuel we need to keep on going. Joy has a way of keeping you together when everything else around you is falling apart. That's what joy is. Things can crumble around you. But guess what? You keep continuing to move forward in faith. Not because you're fake and phony and you're a hypocritical Christian, but because something called joy is what's sustaining you on the inside. When everyone else is falling apart, you can still lift your head. It still hurts, right? Your heart still hurts, but there's something inside of you that says, but the joy of the Lord is my strength. Why? Because your soul doesn't run off of happiness, which is temporary and fleeting. It runs off of Jesus, who is the life and our joy. He is the author and the finisher of your faith. Joy is a gift. It is a tangible confidence, a fuel that comes from God being in our life. See, my soul runs off of joy when I think about the knowledge that, wait a minute, God, you sent your son to die on the cross for my sins. God, when I think about that, when I think about that you have a plan for me, when I think about that, of all the people in the universe, you want to spend time with me? Come on, you think about the different things that produce joy in your life, right? God says, I just want to be with you. I'm thinking about you. You're the apple of my eye. Come on, God thinks about us all the time. It produces joy. 
You know, holidays like Christmas and Thanksgiving are supposed to be times of celebration, but unfortunately for a lot of people, it's painful. And I know there's different reasons that some people have had really difficult lives and many people have lost loved ones during this season. It's hard. But I want to listen. I want to challenge you that during this season, no matter what you're feeling, that just put on joy. Ask the Holy Spirit, could you give me a fresh perspective of joy? Can you give me a fresh infilling of your joy? I know whatever you're dealing with is hard, but joy will give you the ability to stand up and still be positive and still have peace and still have the joy of God in your heart. Life is hard, but man, life without Jesus is harder. It's harder. And my hope this December that in spite of everything you've had to deal with, that you will experience the greatest amount of joy in your life. Just the greatest amount of joy. Over the next couple of weeks, what I want to do is we're going to unpack this idea of finding joy in the middle of affliction. How do we find it? I'm finding joy when you feel like you've lost it all. And then, of course, we're going to do Christmas in the park. And I listen, this is our opportunity to reach the lost, the people that are hurting, the people that are hopeless. We're going to bring the joy of the Lord to them. Amen? That's what we want you to do. You know, you think about this year, 2020, it was marked by many different challenges but also many vic- many different victories. And the truth is, we don't know what 21 will bring. So can I tell you, can I, can I give you a piece of advice? Don't listen to the conspiracy theorists. Get close to Jesus. Worship the Lord. Get in your word. And everything will be fine. Listen to the Holy Spirit. But here's my desire this month, that we will rediscover joy again. Come on, so that God will give you the strength to give you the fuel that you can move forward into 2021 with excitement, knowing that whatever comes your way, I've got the joy of the Lord. Amen. I will I will tell you that I feel like this year, many of us, our emotions have felt like we've been playing ping pong. Right. (laughs) One time you're feeling fearful. The next you're feeling happy. One moment you're feeling anxious, the next moment you're feeling joyful. It's just back and forth, back and forth. And the truth is that our soul's a bit tired from all the emotional ping pong that we've had to manage this year. It's tired. And we need the joy of the Lord. We need this peace to settle our souls. And, and I feel like some of us have been trapped on an emotional roller coaster, up and down and up and down. But I want you to know you're not the only one. But the truth is that some of us, we feel like we've been stuck, but it's been more down than up. More down than up. How many of you love roller coasters? I love roller coasters. I can't do the ones that go like this. Like this is fine. I don't get it. I can go upside down, but I can't go this way. Don't put me in a merry-go-round. I'll vomit. Okay? <laughs> but but, but uh, you have to understand, our lives sometimes feel like it's a roller coaster of emotion, especially this last year. And speaking of roller coasters, I'll tell you a true story of what happens when you get stuck on a roller coaster. It's not fun. My dad got, uh, many years ago, <laughs> my dad got, Got on a, not a roller coaster, but he got more on a pirate ship, okay? Remember that? Pirate ships that go like this? And my, it's rare because my dad did not get on roller coasters, but he decided, you know, it was a family day. We were going to go out and have fun. And my dad decides that he's going to get on that ride because it looked pretty safe. Well, he got on that ride that on that day wasn't safe. He got on that day where I, I, I remember I'm walking towards the pirate ship and I can hear a distinct voice from far away. It was my father's voice piercing through the crowds of thousands of people because what had happened is the pirate ship would not stop. It it broke. It just was on its own, doing its own thing, going back and forth. And I could hear my father say, stop! But because my father has a really bad accent, it's, stop! And you can hear this. You can hear this yelling in the park. And so I'm running, I'm running, I'm running, and I realized that they had to call the technician to get the, they they had to do this e-brake to get it to stop. And needless to say, my father was dazed and confused and dizzy, not to mention angry, right? But isn't that how a lot of us feel, dazed and confused and dizzy with all the different things that have been going on, trapped in a roller coaster of emotions? And I really feel that we're sick of feeling dizzy. We're sick of feeling this way. We're sick of having our lives being thrown around by our feelings, our emotions, or our happenings. We want that fuel, We want that joy that sustains. And so how do I get that joy? I want to give you three simple things. This is a real simple Bible lesson today because we're rediscovering joy. I want to give you three real, how do we get the joy back in our lives? And the first thing you need to understand is that joy comes from God's presence. It comes from his presence, right? Real simple, let's go to Bible, uh, let's go to Galatians chapter 5 verse 22. It says the fruit of the spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, which is patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. 
Real quickly, I want you to see what it says here. But the fruit of the Spirit. It's important that we say that because the fruit of the Spirit is a result of spending time with our Heavenly Father. People think, well, if I just get saved and give my life to Jesus, it's automatic. Nope, 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 nope. That's why Paul tells us in verse 16, he commands us to walk in the Spirit. He says the only way you can get this fruit is you've got to walk in the Spirit. In other words, you've got to learn it. You've got to cultivate it. You've got to want it. You've got to learn this thing. Think about it. When you plant a seed, it doesn't give you fruit overnight. There are things you have to do to the soil to make it work for you. Right? You've got to plant the seed. You've got to water the seed. And so what, what, what Paul's trying to tell you is like when you learn to spend time with your Heavenly Father, the outcome is marked by good fruit. Good fruit starts coming out. And we all know, listen, we all know people that have been in church their whole lives, but they're bitter and angry and frustrated and mad. The Bible doesn't say if you spend time in church, the fruit will develop. No, no, no. The fruit of the Spirit is developed when you walk in the Spirit, when you grow with Jesus, when you want to be with Jesus, when you want to have closeness with God. The outcome of being around your father is joy. You get around your daddy, you pick up those things. My kids act the way I act because they spend time with me. Some of it's not good. I'll admit that, but some of it's good because they picked it up from their daddy. And the closer you closer to our your daddy, you pick it up. And he is the greatest person that gives joy. You pick it up from daddy. Joy is not personality driven. You know, you get people, oh, she's so joyful. It's not a personality. Because then you get other people be like, well, you know, I'm not that, I'm, I'm not that, you know, I'm, I'm not that, that's not my personality. You know? You know, people say, well, I might never experience joy because it's just, I'm not a very joyful person. You ever had people tell you that? Not very, I, don't, I, don't, I don't like to raise my hands in church. I don't like to sing songs, you know. Life is what it is. You get whatever comes to you. No, 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 no. Life's not a personality, ladies and gentlemen. Well, it's not. And listen, can I be honest with you? And we all know people in church that, that you know people in your life that have really, really tough lives, really difficult moments in their life, and they've had their hopes and dreams crushed. But listen, the truth is that your joy is not determined by how you lived your life. It's not determined by that. It's determined by the God of the universe that wants to inject himself in the middle of your life. If you let him. He wants to inject himself in the middle of your storms, in the middle of your trials, in the middle of your affliction, in the middle of your hard time. He wants to bring joy. He rises in the middle of our hardest trials to produce joy that what gives you strength. It's like the Incredible Hulk. His is anger, though. His motivation is anger. There needs to be a Hulk that is motivated by joy. Like the joy of the Lord. They need to make a cartoon character. <laughs> you know, I love that the Bible calls it fruit, right? How many like fruit? I love fruit. How many like fruit bowls? How many do this? How many? I love fruit bowls. You know, you got the watermelon and strawberries and blackberry, all those great things. There's fruit that goes in fruit bowls that I don't necessarily care for. I'll call them fillers. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about? Honeydew melon, cantaloupe. This, this fillers. It's just to make it look full. And if you're, if, you're, if you're a nice person, you, you scoop everything out, and from your own plate, you throw it out. If you're a wicked person, you start picking right from the bowl, right? You don't do that. But he calls it fruit. He calls it fruit. And then the reason it cu- is fruit, okay? Those fill in the gaps is fruit. But the Bible calls it fruit. It's a product of being with God. Because here's why. The real fruit of the Spirit isn't something you can fake. Real fruit of the Spirit isn't something you can fake. Joy comes from God. And you just can't put on a happy face and call it joy from the Lord because people can tell. The Bible says you can tell a tree by its fruit. You can tell it. You, you can't fake joy. You can't fake really joy. And you can't do anything to try to produce more joy in your life, like artificial joy. You can't do that, like drink a substance to produce joy. No, no, that's fleeting. Or take anything else or buy things to make yourself feel joyful. There is nothing you can do artificially to produce joy. It's called fake joy. That's called fake joy. Because you have to understand joy comes from the Lord. So if you ever notice this, you ever notice fake joy? Like when you give a gift to someone, this is how you know. When you give a gift to someone and they open it and you can right away tell that they don't like it. 
But what do they do? Oh, this is, this is, this is so nice. Fake joy right there. You can call it out. We got to this year, this year, listen, we call fake news. We can call out fake joy. Fake joy. Give me my gift back. It's fake joy, right? You, you, you look, when I was a kid, when I was about 12 years old, do you know, 12 is that, that year that your parents aren't quite sure what to get you for Christmas. Cause like you're too old for toys, but you're too, you're too young for other things. And I remember my mom <laughs> bought me this strange gift. Mom, if you're watching, I love you. <laughs> I got this weird gift. And, it, it, and, and I felt like I better put a joyful face on. And I tried, but, but like how many of you have kids? Like you're with your kids and somebody offers your kids something and your kid takes it and, and all of a sudden, I don't like you. Put, put on that joy. Put it, you better fake like you got joy. And be, right? You ever notice it? Fake joy. We can't fake it. You can't, it's called forced joy. You cannot face. Listen, the only way you can produce joy is that's produced by the Holy Spirit inside of our lives, right? But fruit needs to grow. It needs to grow. And what does it need? Soil, sunlight, water. How do you produce joy in your life? Well, let me tell you, proper soil. What's the proper soil? It's the body of Christ. Every tree needs a place to grow. It's called an orchard. And an orchard is a series of trees with connected roots that grows together. You know what they do? They're encouraging each other and they bear fruit at the same time. It's called the body of Christ. And when a younger tree is sick, and this is true in an orchard, when there's a younger tree that is sick, other trees sense that and they begin to pump nutrients through their roots to strengthen the smaller tree. Try doing that on your own. They strengthen the other tree. The right orchard, the right body of Christ is needed to help you produce the right fruit. Here's another thing they need. Here's another thing you need to know is fruit is seasonal. It's seasonal. It doesn't always, it's not all the time, which means that fruit, the fruit has time to develop even in dormant seasons. So even though you don't see it, God's still growing it. And a dormant season for you might be a dark season, might be a season of testing, of affliction. But all the while, the seed of joy is germinating within you to produce a greater harvest when you need it the most. See, it's, it's sleeping. Fruit needs water and sunshine to grow. And we have to be intentional every single day to make sure that we're watering our relationship with Jesus. How? The word, the word prayer, worship. You know, we've been coming first Wednesday nights of prayer. Well, you should come. What are we doing? We're learning how to just soak in his presence, how to just worship and get in his word, how to just pray. That's how you grow. The, that's how you grow the fruit. That's how you grow. You've got to learn how to soak in God's presence. Reading the Bible is not like reading a shopping list, ladies and gentlemen. You got to say, Holy Spirit, speak to me today. What do you want to say to me, right? And, and be, uh, you want to be with him, talk with him, enjoy his presence. That's how joy flourishes in that type of environment. Joy is produced through worship. Psalm 1611, you will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. And in your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. So when we gather, when we sing songs like we did this morning, this is not like a... a to, for a concert. This isn't to please you because you like a certain song. No, this is when we're giving of ourselves to him. We're emptying our hearts of worship. We're loving. We want to be with him. Worship is when we stop everything in our lives and acknowledge God that I need you and I love you and I want to be with you. And guess what happened? Joy flourishes. Joy grows. But there's still something else that a tree or a plant needs in order to produce good fruit. That's called fertilizer. Now, who knows what really good fertilizer is made out of? <laughs> Stinks, doesn't it? Really good fertilizer comes from the back end of a cow. And hear me, as I was writing this this week, I really felt like some people feel like, you know, I felt like 2020, the enemy just dumped a whole bunch of fertilizer on me. But here's, here's what you need to know. If you let the Holy Spirit mix that fertilizer into the soil of your life, it will produce something richer and greater because of joy in your life. Fertilizer. We need fertilizer. It's stinky, but it's good for you. It, even though, and listen, I want you to know that out of this fertilizer season, God can produce greater fruit. It's your fertilizer season. John 15, too, and part of that, too, is pruning. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, guess what he does? He prunes it. That it may what? Bear more fruit. Pruning isn't necessarily good, but I think that God was doing a really good job pruning the church in 2020. 
Romans 8, 28, and we, all, and we know that all things work together for the good of those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. All things, ladies and gentlemen. All things means the crappy, stinking, pruning season of 2020. God's using it for my good. The second thing you need for joy is you need to understand for joy is that joy comes from the right perspective. This is so important. Look at James chapter 1. Many of us know it. Verse 2. Consider it pure joy. It's just pure joy. You know what that is? That's 100% no preservatives, organic joy. Pure. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Now, it, come on. We all know that the very first thing we feel when we're facing a hard time is not joy. It's not. None of us will be like, oh, yes. Oh, I'm so excited. None of us feels that way. We feel confused, we feel angry, we feel hurt, we feel dismayed, we don't feel any joy. So what the heck is James talking about? You ever ask, what is he talking about? What is James talking about? Here's what you need to understand. The key word in this scripture is consider. In other words, he says, be careful with the perspective that you take whenever you're faced with a challenging situation. You see, when we're faced with hard times, there are only two ways that you can see it. You'll either see it with joy or with disappointment. You'll either see that there's light at the end of the tunnel or you're going to be stuck here forever. You either see the glass half empty or the glass half full. It's perspective. And James says, consider it. Consider means to think carefully about it. God is asking us to think a little deeper when we face hard times. He's telling you, I need you to take a sailor, a pause a minute. Before you lose your mind, take a pause and consider that what you're dealing with right now is going to produce joy in your life. Take a pause because hardship sometimes clouds our emotions and we can't see with the right perspective. That's why it's always important to slow down and consider first. See, church people, we have a real amazing spiritual gift called complaining and grumbling. We do. So many of our lives are mar marked by the grace of God. God has provided for us by from his very hand. Every single morning we wake up to renewed mercies. In other words, we're living with things that we don't deserve. And yet because our perspective is off, we cannot see it. And so instead what we are, we're ungrateful, spoiled, entitled kids. Why? Because we've allowed our joy to leak. It's been leaking for a while. You know, you get out of bed. And instead of thanking God, I'm alive today, praise God. We're like, oh, I got to get out of bed again. I don't want to get out of bed, right? Maybe you're on your, on your way to work, right? And you're complaining about how much you hate your boss and hate your job. God's saying, but I provided you a job to pay for your bills. You're inside of your car. And you're stuck in traffic and you're mad at everybody else. Hey, thank God you ain't walking. You could be walking in 97 degrees and 99% and humidity to work, but instead you're in an air-conditioned car and we've lost perspective, right? We come to church and some of us, well, I don't know if I want to go to church because I might get coronavirus. We got all these different things. Let me give you, and I'll give you a pass. I'll let you complain one time about COVID-19 because I know I have. I know I have. But here's the truth. Like a plug that is pulled out of a bathtub when we lose perspective and start to complain, our joy will leak away. Complaining is the disease that eats away at joy. It eats away. Everything that God is trying to bring into your life, you don't see it. And we have become just like the people of Israel. You'll notice that while they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, they didn't have to work. Yet God said, I'm going to give you fresh food every day. Some of us are afraid we were not going to get enough toilet paper. And God said, I'm going to provide you with fresh food, fresh food every day. And every single day on cue when they would wake up, fresh manna from heaven, fresh, hot, warm manna, whatever that was from heaven. And it lasted them the entire day. And God says, I don't want you eating leftovers because I'm such a good father. I'm going to give you fresh food tomorrow. 
and he gave them fresh. And when they were tired of that, guess what? They said, God, I want some fried chicken. God said, I'm going to send you some quail. And all this quail came out. They ate so much quail that they again wanted to say, they want to become vegetarians because I had too much quail. And they go back to the manna. And do you realize that while they were in the wilderness, they never had to go do it. God provided them water from a brook, sweet, clean water every single time. And guess what happens? Like them, what they do? And on top of that, the Bible says that their clothes did not wear out for 40 years, that their sandals did not wear out. And I got to tell you, their stuff was out of style after 40 years, but it did not wear out. And yet they grumbled and they complained and they forgot. They forgot that they were free. They forgot that God opened the Red Sea for them. They forgot that God provided, had a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And here we are, we complain about everything. And God said, if you just re- did you forget that I made you free? I set you free from the oppressor. Still come on. And that's how we've become. We've, they lost their per- perspective. Their joy leaked out. And instead, what we need to do is, guess what? When we don't feel like it, you want joy, you get up. God, I thank you. I woke up this morning. My heart is beating. Hallelujah. My feet work. Jesus. God, God, I thank you. I got warm water in my bathtub. God, I thank you. I got gas in my car. I thank you. I got a job that pays my bills, Jesus. God, I thank you. I got three kids. Sometimes they drive me crazy, but God, I got three kids. You just got to change your perspective. You start to worship God. God, I thank you that I get to go to church and get with the people of God. And we get to worship you. We get to hear the word of God. We get to leave encouraged. God, I thank you. Instead of, oh, I got to go serve again. Come on. We got to change our perspective. And what happens is, and when you come in here, you start to worship God. Something starts bubbling up in your heart. It's called the joy of the Lord. It starts bubbling up. Guess what? Here's what's important. Notice this. Nothing has changed in your life. You still got the same car, the same job, the same bed that you live in. But what happened? Your perspective changed and now there's fullness of joy. Fullness of joy. James says, consider it. Be deliberate about it. Take a position of gratitude and thanksgiving. Joy of the Lord. And the third one is joy comes from holding on to the promises of God. Hebrews 12, 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. See, joy joy also comes from recognizing that there's a greater joy than what we have here on the earth. Some of our family members and friends this year have experienced that joy. They've got on to a greater joy. That means we have something greater to look forward to. But I cannot tell you that the only way Jesus was able to endure the cross was the fact that his pain meant our gain. See, in the Garden of Gethsemane, we see momentarily the humanity of Jesus as he begins to to realize the grisly nature of what's getting ready to happen to his life. And you see that in the next verse, he says this. He says, Father, Daddy, there's any other way if there's any other way and in this in this divine pause this divine moment that he's considering we can insert the scripture before the joy that was set before him and he says not my will but your will be done what did jesus saw he saw something greater he saw humanity being saved. He saw heaven being populated by brothers and sisters. He, he saw hurting, broken people being healed. He saw broken homes being restored. He saw runaway kids coming home. That's what Jesus saw. He saw humanity being healed. And he heard his father saying, this is my son whom I love. He says, I love him. And he says, with him I am well pleased. In that moment, Jesus That was the joy. That was the joy that gave him the strength to help him endure the cross. See, the joy of the Lord is my strength. In that moment, Jesus needed strength. And we have a greater that awaits us. A joy that's only found in the pages of this word right here. And in the hands, to know that we are in the hands of our loving Father. He'll never let us go. And I know that the enemy of our life has tried to use the circumstances of this year to right, try to steal your joy. But can I tell you, the world didn't give it to you and the world can't take it away. 
you know, I want to close with this story, and, and, and then I'm going to pray. I, I didn't have it planned this morning, but I felt this morning. I want to stay, go back to perspective as, if I can. Everyone, you got an Amber Alert. Father, we pray let that child be found in Jesus' name. But um, I shared a, a video that a friend of mine, a pastor of mine, had sent to me a while ago. You might have seen it or not, but it, it was about a past pastor, Cordero is his name. He was in China. <clears throat> he was in China doing a leadership conference with, uh, with about uh, 22 uh, Chinese church leaders. And he was in this room with them, uh, and he began to share with them. And out of these 22 leaders, he, he asked them, hey, he said, he, he said to them, he says, what would, what would happen if we get caught? And they said, well, you would, you would get arrested, but you'd get be deported, and you'd be sent home tomorrow. And he said, well, what's going to happen to you guys? He says, well, we'd probably get arrested and spend three years in jail. And he says, well, out of the 22 of you, how many have you been to jail? He said, 19 of them raised their hands. We have been to jail for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ in China. So he said, okay, let's open up our Bibles. Open up their Bibles, 1 Peter chapter whatever. And he said, I, had, uh, seven, I only had 17 Bibles. That means five of them could not have Bibles. He says, but I noticed as I gave him the Bibles, he said a few of them were passing Bibles to those that needed it. And you have to understand that smuggling Bibles into China is illegal. And he had these Bibles, and he was curious because the people were giving the Bibles to the others. Well, he, one of the things he had asked him, he says, between all of you 22 people, he goes, how many, how many people do you oversee in the, in the underground church here in China? And they said, about 22 million. Tw these 22 leaders lead 22 million people. And so as they're reading the, the scriptures, he notices one lady is mouthing the whole chapter as he's reading it. And curious, he went up to her and he says, I noticed you gave your Bible over. She goes, well, I, I memorized that chapter. She said, I memorized that chapter. He goes, really? When, when did you memorize that chapter? She goes, when I was in prison. And he says, but don't they confiscate your Bible in, in, in jail? She goes, yes. She goes, but, but the believers bring me scriptures written on pieces of paper, and they bring them to me in prison, and I memorize the scripture. And he says, well, don't they confiscate that? She goes, that's why you need to memorize it quickly. And I, and I was listening to this, and of course, it's perspective, yeah. perspective. And, and so they went on. They had a great time. And at the end, the, the guy, the people said, would you pray for us, Pastor, that, you know, we see all the freedoms that you have in America, freedom to get together and have church like we do. He says, could you pray that we will be like you? Yeah. And the pastor lowered his head and sat, and he says, I, I could never pray that you could have what we have. And, of course, they were indignant and disappointed, and they said, why? And he says, well, he said, you traveled 13 hours by train to get here. He says, if anyone needs to travel more than 45 minutes, they won't come to church. He says, not only did you travel 13 hours, he goes, but you came and you sat on this hardwood floor with no air conditioning. He says, in America, if we don't have padded fuse and air conditioning and wonderful lights and good sound, people won't come back to church. I, and he says, in America, the average person has two Bibles, but we don't read them. He says, you have no Bibles, and you memorize them from pieces of paper. He said, I can never pray for you to be like us, but instead for us to be like you. And when I saw that video, it broke my heart because I thought, perspective, God. We think we got it all together, and we don't. We don't. And I said, Lord, Help me, Father God, those people gladly, willfully, full of the joy of the Lord, knowing at the risk of being arrested, got on a train and traveled 13 hours to be three days on a hard wooden floor, but they just wanted to be with Jesus. And we've got people today that we've just, we, we'll pick a day that we want to come to church and another that we don't. And, well, I don't know if I, I'd rather do online church is convenient or this and that. I'm not against. Listen, I know some of you can't, but I'm just saying that here in America, it's just be church Christianity has become an, a, a religion of, of just convenience. And I think that that has sucked the joy of the Lord out of us. And we just need to turn our hearts back to the Lord. I feel that God wants us to experience fresh joy. Yes. You know, the thought of all the people that we get to invite, even on this Christmas event, you know, to know that we can share the joy of Christ with them. Right. It's the hope of Jesus. Listen, I want to close. If you would just bow your heads with me.
If you're watching right now and maybe you feel, Pastor, I don't have any joy. I don't know if I don't know where my joy is. I want joy back in my life. But I want you to know that Jesus makes it easy for you to have joy. I want to be very clear about who this Jesus is. He's the Son of God, perfect in every way. He never sinned. He invited people like you and me to be forgiven and to be filled with joy. He came for those who are hurting. He came for those who are broken. It was a perfect sacrifice. He died on the cross for our sins. And on the third day, listen, God raised him from the dead so that anyone, that includes you and me, can be forgiven of our sins. Listen, if you're watching right now online and you recognize, Pastor, I want this joy. I don't have it. I don't have a sense of security that my sins have been forgiven, but I want it. All I want to tell you today is just I want you to just pray. Believe in your heart that Jesus is enough, right? And today, if you want to let go of that sin, if you want that joy in your life, I want you to pray this prayer with me out loud. Pray this prayer with me right where you're sitting, wherever you're at. Whether you're at home in your living room, whether you're sitting in a bar, whether you're in your car right now. Just take a moment. Pray this prayer with me. Jesus, today by faith, I give you my life. I repent of my sins. Forgive me. Save me. Make me brand new. Fill me with your spirit so I can follow you. Fill me with your joy. I give you my life. I completely surrender my life to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, I just want to take a moment if you prayed that prayer. I want to welcome you to the body of Christ. I want to welcome you to God's family. I want you to do something for me. If you did that, right, right on the chat box, just write, I prayed to receive Christ. And I want to follow up with you. I want to pray with you. It's so important that you find a place where you can grow your joy. For those of you that are here, listen, I thank you so much. I pray this season that God will fill you with so much joy, that your perspective will change, that we'll, instead of always complaining, we'll just be thankful for everything. I know it's so easy. Isn't it easy to complain? It's so, so easy. It takes moments where we have to consider it and be thankful. Father, I pray for those that are here. My prayer, Father God, is that you bless them, strengthen them, encourage them. I pray in this season, Father God, let, let them be draw close to you, Father, I pray. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Amen.